watching Eagle News America. I'm Alan Basso Yahib coming to you from Los Angeles. And it's Thursday, April 15, 2021. We have updates from our correspondents across North America. Anna Kui in Las Vegas, Nevada. Governor Sisolak announces goal for Nevada counties to fully open by June 1. Jane Kathleen Gregorio in Corpus Christi. Texas governor urges president and vice president to designate Mexican drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. Texas issues drought disaster declaration in 73 counties and the Star of Texas Awards nominations are open now for first responders. Several reports from our California team. Kara Galado in Woodland Hills. Arc Lake Cinemas and Pacific Theaters are closing their doors permanently. Brianna Andrade in Santa Clarita. Los Angeles County expands COVID-19 vaccination eligibility to individuals age 16 and older. Tristan Diaz in Bakersfield, California. Pomona Fairplex to house unaccompanied migrant children arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border. A JP Era in Sacramento reports about museums there reopening this month. Heading over to Eastern United States, Carlo Valdez in Union Township reports. And for business news, Bobby Soriano also reports about the country's retail industry seeing strong growth in March. E-wallet provider Plantina securing funding to expand in the Philippines and a bubble tea shortage in the U.S. looms. Today, we get to go cruising down the streets of Guam. Plus, for National Banana Day, we won't be talking about recipes nor food with bananas in them. Instead, we get to find out things that make our team go bananas. Our coverage begins now. United Nations Coordinator for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, Didi Trebu, warns Wednesday that the humanitarian and economic crisis unleashed by the eruption of the La Soufre volcano on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent will last months and could extend to nearby islands. Uh, expected that continuous explosion and ash fall uh, will continue over the coming weeks uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadine, uh, but also in neighboring islands uh, such as Barbados, which has been also severely affected with uh, the ash plan, uh, as well as St. Lucia or Grenada. So we are facing a situation with a great deal of uncertainty and uh, also a humanitarian crisis that is, uh, that is growing uh, and that may continue for uh, weeks and months. We're talking about a situation where 20% of the population have been displaced uh, for now in Ireland. Uh, some have been taken some, some boats, or fishermen boats, to, to, to leave the island and go into neighboring countries, but the numbers are not very high so far. But in reality, 100% of the population is uh, indirectly affected by the situation. But there are also long-term consequences in terms of environmental health. That is why the cleanup of the ashes and the disposal of the ashes is extremely important. Uh, this can have consequences, you know, in terms of water availability, um, in terms also of animal husbandry, uh, so uh, in terms of food production. So it's very important that we're able to address uh, the issue of ashes and disposal of ashes and cleanup of the ashes as soon as possible. In calling for more robust international aid, Trebu noted that hurricane season in the Caribbean is set to begin in two months and that tourism, the main source of income for the islands, has been severely curtailed by the COVID-19 pandemic. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is currently a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. In other news, Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said Thursday that a Russian response to new U.S. sanctions was inevitable and that the ministry had summoned U.S. Ambassador to Moscow, John Sullivan. The United States earlier Thursday announced economic sanctions against Russia and expulsion of 10 diplomats in retaliation for alleged election interference, a massive cyber attack, and other hostile activity. США не готовы мириться с объективной реальностью многополярного мира исключающего американскую гегемонию, делая ставку на санкционное давление и вмешательство в наши внутренние дела. Подобное агрессивное поведение, безусловно, получит решительный отпор. Ответ на санкции будет неотвратимым. В Вашингтоне должны осознать, что за деградацию двусторонних отношений придется расплачиваться. Ответственность за происходящее целиком лежит на Соединенных Штатах Америки. 
Zakharosa, uh, Zakharova also said that Russia's foreign ministry had summoned U.S. Ambassador Sullivan for a conversation that she said will be difficult for the American side. The sanctions come after tensions soared in recent weeks with Russia massing troops on its border with Ukraine and Kiev's Western allies calling on Moscow to back down. Ties had already plunged last month when President Joe Biden agreed with a description of Russian President Vladimir Putin as a killer. Relations have been in freefall since 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine and fighting erupted between Kiev's forces and pro-Russia separatists in the east. Back in Washington, congressional Democrats introduced legislation Thursday to expand the U.S. Supreme Court from 9 to 13 justices, drawing angry protests from Republicans accusing their rivals of attempting a power grab to enact President Joe Biden's agenda. The surprise move appears to be an effort by the party's progressive wing to pressure Biden on the explosive issue less than one week after the president announced he was forming a commission to study reforming the nation's high court, including the question of expanding its bench. Several liberal Democrats have said such expansion is necessary after Donald Trump gave the bench a firm conservative majority by getting three of his picks onto the Supreme Court during his presidency, including one just eight days before the 2020 election. Our democracy is in jeopardy today because the Supreme Court's standing is sorely damaged. And the way we repair it is straightforward. We undo the damage that the Republicans have done by restoring balance. And we do it by adding four seats to the court to create a 13-member Supreme Court. And it also will enable us to do justice and to rectify the great injustice that was done in packing the court. And t some people will say we're packing the court. We're not packing it, we're unpacking it. Senator McConnell and the Republicans packed the court over the last couple of years, as Senator uh, uh, Markey outlined. So this is a, a, a reaction to that. It's a necessary step in the evolution of the court. The move appears doomed to fail, at least for now. Asked whether she supports the bill, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi simply told reporters no, adding she had no plans to bring it to the floor for a vote. Biden himself has been hesitant about the issue, and last year during the campaign, he said he did not support expanding the court. But as president, he has agreed to consider it. The president last week signed an executive order creating a bipartisan commission of legal and judicial scholars former administration officials, and former federal judges to weigh the highly charged issue of reforming the body. But the new legislation has raised eyebrows across the political spectrum in Washington, where expanding the courts, even with the commission's study, would be a very heavy lift in such a deeply divided Congress. Now for COVID news. The director of the World Health Organization's Europe branch, Hans Kluh, gives an online press briefing from Athens with an update on the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic in the region. Take a look. It is only among the oldest that we are seeing declining incidents. Over the past two months, the trend among people more than 80 years of age has diverged from the trend seen in every other age group. Possibly thanks to high vaccination uptake in this high-risk group. The proportion of COVID-19 deaths in Europe among those older than 80 has gradually fallen to close to 30%, the lowest level since the beginning of the pandemic. But let me be clear, early signs of decline are not equal to low rates of transmission. Transmission must be driven down to low rates and kept low by harnessing our energy and resilience to beat the virus. The availability of all public health and social measures is critical, including the rollout of vaccines. Adjusting social measures must be done, not based on vaccination targets, but on the basis of epidemiology and the ability of our health services and workforce to cope with COVID-19 and to maintain basic public health services. We urge member states to report any adverse events that may occur following vaccination as early as possible. For now, the risk of suffering blood clots is much higher for someone with COVID-19 than for someone who has taken the AstraZeneca vaccine. There will be no doubt about this. The AstraZeneca vaccine is effective in reducing COVID-19 hospitalization and preventing deaths. 
WHO recommends it to all eligible adults to gain protection from the SARS-CoV-2 virus as quickly as possible. In the nation's capital, beginning Monday, April 19, Washington, D.C. residents 65 and older will be able to get vaccinated without an appointment at walk-up sites across the district. The announcement was made by Mayor Browser and Bowser and D.C. Health, led by Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt. Each of the 10 sites which will administer either the two-dose Pfizer vaccine or the two-dose Moderna vaccine will accommodate up to 30 walk-in appointments each day. Residents 65 and older can walk up during the days and times designated for each site. For the list of this walk-up sites and more information, visit vaccinate.dc.gov. For today's COVID-19 numbers, according to the Coronavirus Resource Center of Johns Hopkins University and Medicine, as of 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Thursday, April 15, 2021, the number of cases of COVID-19 reported worldwide is now over 138,634,000. Top three on the list of countries with recorded cases are the U.S. at over 31.4 million, India at over 14 million, and Brazil at over 13.6 million. To date, more than 2,978,000 have succumbed to this virus. The U.S. leads the countries with the most number of COVID-19-related deaths, with over 564,000. Brazil is next with more than 361,000. And Mexico has more than 210,000. When we come back, updates from Nevada and California. This is Eagle News America. Stay with us. Events happen around us all the time, in our community, in our country, around the world. Events that affect people, move communities, or simply inspire us. Interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times. We continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events. Fast, accurate, balanced. Eagle News, because we live in interesting times. In good shape. No doctor far and wide? Then you can visit one virtually. He's just sending his voice and his picture. Diagnoses via video chat. Back exercises with a tablet. It's even possible to see a midwife online. What are the benefits of digital health care? In good shape. You're watching Eagle News America. I'm Alan Basoyahe in Los Angeles. The state of Nevada will fully reopen by June 1st. That's the goal set by Governor Steve Sisolak. Are all Nevada counties on board? Bureau Chief Anna Kui joins us tonight with the answers. Yes, thank you, Alan. Uh, it's definitely been a work in progress. For more than a year, local governments, uh, state health officials, emergency managers, local health authorities, and community partners have come together in a statewide response to COVID-19. More recently, according to Nevada's Roadmap to Recovery, COVID-19 mitigation measures will transfer to local authorities starting May 1, and each Nevada county has been working with the COVID-19 Mitigation and Management Task Force to finalize plans for this since it was first announced in February uh, this year. So what will this transition look like? Um, each county will be able to make decisions based on what is best for their communities while taking into account, you know, still the same data that's going to be provided, the same uh, dashboard will be provided. Um, they're going to be looking at transmission rate of the virus, vaccination rate, testing, and other infrastructure needs specific to their communities. And all of this effort will help meet Governor Sisolak's goal to have all of Nevada counties open to 100% capacity by June 1. May 1, Allen, is also an uh, important date uh, in addition to that transition to local authorities because on May 1, uh, Governor Sisolak announced that the statewide social distancing mandate will be removed on that day. But it will still be up to the local authority in each county whether 
social distancing will be removed within the communities. It is important to note, though, that while the state will be transitioning authority over social distancing measures to the counties, the mask mandate will remain in effect statewide for now. There was no timeline um, discussed during the press conference um, you know, regarding the mask mandate. During the press conference, one of the questions asked Governor Sisolak was, why, you know, why announce the full opening now when the course of the pandemic is unpredictable, especially with the presence of the variants in the state? Well, Sisolak's response was that, you know, the government will respond accordingly should changes have to be made. You know, that, like he said, for over a year now, they've made um, decisions, sometimes decisions that, are, that were really hard to make, um, not the popular ones, but, you know, they've had to adjust uh, during the course of the pandemic. Everything, everything is fluid and everything will, be continue, will continue to be fluid and they will adjust with the priority still remains the health and safety of all Nevadans. Now, Alan, you know, I think the vaccination rate plays a big part in the governor's decision to open to full capacity by June 1. Um, in just 10 days since, vac since vaccine eligibility opened to all Nevadans 16, and 16 years and older, as of Tuesday, about 39% of Nevadans in that population group have already received one dose of the COVID uh, vaccine. And almost a quarter of that same population, 16 years and older, are already fully vaccinated. In Las Vegas, Anna Kui, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Alan. Uh, Anna, June 1st is it's just around the corner. So what's helping the vaccination rollout in your state? Yeah, so, you know, I, it, I think it, it's two things, two main things. Um, first of all, the supply. Um, in the beginning of the, the vaccine rollout back in December, we were, you know, having maybe less than 10,000 doses per week. And now that supply, that vaccine supply is up to 74,000 per week, according to state officials. So that's a huge difference. You know, so that's um, more doses available to more Nevadans. And then the other, the other thing too, is that Nevada Health Response, which has been the, um, the, the website for the, the statewide, it's the one-stop all COVID-19 um, information um, that was started that was created since the start of the pandemic they actually partnered with immunize nevada um, to create a um a vaccination communication outreach um, strategy so as you can see there on the screen you know they've uh these campaigns uh, these campaigns include um the different uh communities the different diverse community in nevada it acknowledges people hesitancy of the vaccine instead of instead of challenging it. Um, it highlights moments of human connection that, you know, that we missed during the pandemic, uh, reminding people, educating people that the, being, that the vaccination is the pathway to you know, not only regain those memories, but to create new ones. So, and I think that's helping. I mean, I actually, they have a hashtag a hashtag three million reasons is what um, is what they're they're doing. So every time a Nevadan gets the vaccination and they post it in any of the social platforms, social media platforms, they're asked to use that hashtag, hashtag three million reasons why they got vaccinated. And it seems to be working, Alan. Well, we're glad to hear that the vaccinations are in greater supply over there, uh, Anna. Uh, something else that's always in great supply are things that drives us bananas, and that's actually what we'll be talking about a little bit later. And so at this time, what I want to do is uh, I'd like you to just give us one word, the subject matter, the topic of what drives you bananas, and what I'm going to try to do is try to figure out what it is that drives you bananas based on my own personal experience about the subject matter. So if you could, Anna, in just one word, what drives you bananas? Uh, one word. People. People, yes, okay, so I believe it's something along the lines of what I experience all the time. For example, when you're in, in line for the groceries uh, and all, all, all you have to do is buy some bananas in this example, and you pick the shortest line, but sure enough, when you get near the front, the person in front of you needs to have a price check, right? The runner has to go, and so you get delayed, and so all the other people in the longer lines will get done before you. And you know they're wearing masks, so I can't see them uh, laughing or smiling at me, but their eyes tell a different story. And so I believe when you say people, what drives you bananas is when you get held up in the grocery store line. How did it do, Anna? 
We will, we will see, Alan. We will see. Okay, I have a good feeling about that. We'll talk to you a little bit later. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Now in Los Angeles County, everyone aged 16 and up are now eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccination. In Santa Clarita, Eagle News correspondent Brianna Andrade has the details. Thank you, Alan. The county and city of Los Angeles open COVID-19 vaccination eligibility to all Angelinos that are at least 16 years old and above. Los Angeles adult residents are currently able to schedule appointments for the COVID-19 vaccination on the county website at vaccinatelacounty.com or the city online portal website at coronavirus.lacity.org slash vaxappointment. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti states, opening vaccine vaccine eligibility to all Angelinos who are 16 and older is a major milestone in our efforts to get more shots into more arms and defeat COVID-19 once and for all. We urge patients as we continue to ramp up our operations, obtain more doses, and enter this new phase of our campaign to end the pandemic. But our commitment remains clear. As soon as vaccines are available, we are ready to administer them swiftly and safely. This announcement expand eligibility for the COVID-19 vaccine to all adults residing in Los Angeles County and city comes at a perfect time as the city takes over the state's large scale COVID-19 vaccine operations at Cal State LA, which opened to the public in February. This has just ended last weekend on April 11 after completing its eight week project timeframe being operated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA, and the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, or Cal OES. This is part of the federal government's program to distribute and administer the vaccine in an effective, safe, and equal way. Cal OES Director Mark Ghilarducci says, the Cal State Los Angeles vaccine site has been critical in California's ability to support some of the communities most impacted by COVID-19. We appreciate the leadership of Mayor Garcetti and the city to keep this hugely successful site open for the weeks to come. As California relinqu relinquishes management of COVID-19 vaccine administration and operations at Cal State LA to Los Angeles, the city will have the potential capacity to schedule and administer about 54,000 vaccines per day at this location. All of this will be done through a joint collaboration with the Los Angeles Fire Department and the Community Organized Relief Effort with the local staff from FEMA and Cal OES. This will be the ninth one added to the eight permanent sites established throughout the city at San Fernando Park, Hanson Dam, Crenshaw Christian Center, Lincoln Park, Pierce College, USC University Park, Los Angeles Southwest College, and Dodger Stadium as well as to the various mobile and pop-up location and the county's permanent COVID-19 vaccination sites. Los Angeles is doing their part on the county and city level to progress past the pandemic and move forward in aiming to protect all their residents from the coronavirus and be in line with California's plans to reopen in two months from now on June 15. In Santa Clarita, California, Brianna Andrade, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Alan. Uh, Brianna, with COVID-19 vaccinations ramping up to now include those 16 years and older, how strong has the response been from LA County and uh, city residents? Well, Alan, we just checked the online registration portal and as of this moment, all appointments are fully booked. And for those still hoping to get on the vaccination list, they're being advised to check back later for possible openings next week. So if zero availability is any indication, I'd say that the response from Angelinos has been very positive. A positive trend uh, for those who get in, but unfortunately, maybe not so those who are uh, still waiting for it. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit, Rihanna, talk about our discussion today about bananas. Okay, so we're going to run the same exercise with you. In just one word, what is it that drives you bananas? And I'm going to try to guess based on my experience. I feel like my word is going to give it away just by a lot. Um, my word is siblings. Siblings. I think I know where you're going with this, Brianna, because I myself uh, am the youngest of three. And so I believe here's what makes you go bananas. It's when uh, the uh, older siblings uh, push around the, the youngest 
precious, innocent uh, sibling in the family. And I believe that that's what drives you bananas when the youngest uh, gets pushed around by the, by the elder siblings. Am I right or how close am I? That's definitely one way to look at the word siblings when it comes to bananas. But, um... <laughs> are, you the youngest sibling in your, are you the youngest sibling in your family? No, I'm actually the oldest, so a little, little oh. different over here. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about two different things. In any case, I can't wait to hear from you a little bit later. Thank you for your report, Brianna. Thank you, Alan. Two big movie theater companies are closing their doors permanently after halting operations last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In Woodland Hills, Kay Regalado reports. Thank you, Alan. Pacific theaters and Arclight cinemas in Los Angeles remain closed permanently to Angelinos after a recent announcement by these movie theater chains that they will no longer reopen after closing its doors for over a year due to the pandemic. Both Pacific theaters and Arclight cinemas are owned and operated by the Decurion Corporation. Like many other companies whose revenues thrive on drawing in social and large gatherings, the great financial impacts caused by the COVID-19 situation made it very difficult for these businesses to remain above water. Pacific Theaters operates about 300 screens in California, with the most popular ones found here in Los Angeles County at The Grove, The Americana, and Arclight Hollywood, featuring the historic monument and tourist attraction Cinerama Dome. Pacific Theaters and Arclight Cinemas announce and post on their websites. This was not the outcome anyone wanted. But despite a huge effort that exhausted all potential options, the company does not have a viable way forward. To all the Pacific and Arclight employees who have devoted their professional lives to making our theaters the very best places in the world to see movies, we are grateful for your service and your dedication to our customers. To our guests and members of the film industry who have made, it going, to, to have made going to the movies such a magical experience over the years, our deepest thanks. It has been an honor and a pleasure to serve you. In Woodland Hills, California, Kara Galato, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Alan. Uh, the good old Cinerama Dome. I know it quite well, but Kay, can you elaborate for our viewers? Definitely. The Cinerama Dome is a geodesic concrete dome located in the heart of Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. It is a tourist attraction and known for its state-of-the-art use of three projectors to create a custom curved screen. Only one of the three in the world to have this capability. Back to you, Alan. Okay, I'd also like to hear from you. What is your one word description of what drives you bananas? And I'm going to try to guess based on my personal experience. One word, all right. Um, let's have education. Education. I know exactly. I've experienced some things that drive me bananas when it comes to education. Uh, driving up to go pick up my child from school, just to remember when I get there that I actually have no children. I, I really dislike when that happens. It turns out, well, you know, you just end up lining up behind other cars thinking they're giving away something. It turns out it's to pick up kids. And we know parents aren't giving away kids, although perhaps some might want to. So is picking up children that don't exist uh, what drives you bananas, Kate? Uh, I think perhaps this is a very interesting perspective to look at it. Um, but I think maybe mine is a, a bit of a different um, view on it. <laughs> Well, we can't wait to hear what your perspective is when it comes to education, driving you bananas. Thank you, Kay, for your report. Up next, more updates from Texas and California. Eagle News America will return shortly. is quite as simple as it seems. To understand the world better, we need to take a closer look. Experience knowledge, tomorrow today. You're watching Eagle News America. I'm Alan Basoyahe in Los Angeles. Several stories from the Lone Star State tonight. Governor Greg Abbott is urging President Biden and Vice President Harris to designate Mexican cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. Bureau Chief Jane Kathleen Gregorio with this story and more. Thank you, Alan, and howdy from the Lone Star State. 
On Thursday, Texas Governor Greg Abbott sent a letter to President Biden and Vice President Harris urging the federal government to designate Mexican drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. The letter included a background document detailing how these drug cartels clearly meet the three-part test required for the designation. The letter reads, as governor of Texas, I urge you to take immediate action to combat the dangerous and deadly Mexican drug cartels. These cartels bring terror into our communities. They smuggle narcotics and weapons into the United States to fund their illegal enterprises. They force women and children into human trafficking, enriching themselves on the misery and enslavements of immigrants. They murder innocent people, including women and children. These Mexican drug cartels are foreign terrorist organizations, and it is time for the federal government to designate them as such. This marks the fourth letter issued by the governor to the Biden administration regarding the southern border humanitarian crisis, with previous letters, questions, and concerns thus far gone unanswered by the president and vice president. Meanwhile, in response to drought conditions in Texas for the month of April, the governor also issued a disaster declaration on Thursday naming 73 counties whose significantly low rainfall and prolonged dry conditions continue to increase the threat of wildfire across these regions. The drought conditions pose an imminent threat to public health, property, and the economy. In other news, Nominations for the 2021 Star of Texas Awards are being accepted from now until June 15, 2021. These awards recognize peace officers, firefighters, emergency medical first responders, and federal law enforcement who were killed or seriously injured in the line of duty. The nominations are now open and must be received by the governor's office on or before June 15. Private citizens who were seriously injured or killed while attempting to help a peace officer, firefighter, or emergency medical first responder perform their duties can also be nominated. Governor Abbott stated, the Star of Texas Awards are a way for Texans to show our gratitude to those who serve. It is an honor to recognize these brave men and women who put themselves in danger in the name of public safety. To be eligible for the 2021 award, the incident must have occurred between September 1, 2003 and June 15, 2021. The nomination form can be accessed through the governor's office website at gov.texas.gov. Meanwhile, hope you are staying safe and healthy there in your part of the country. In Corpus Christi, Texas, I'm Jane Kathleen Gregorio, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Alan. Uh, Jane, thank you so much for that report. We want to jump straight into what we'll be discussing a little bit later about uh, National Banana Day. And so the same exercise here. Give us one word about your subject, and I'll try to guess it based on something I've experienced. My one word clue is ears. Ears. Ears, as in these things. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I, well, for me, what drives me bananas is when I'm talking to someone, uh, but then they point at their ear as if they have a Bluetooth uh, ear, earbud in their ear and say, you know, and they give me the hand and say, no, I can't talk to you right now. But just in my gut, I have a feeling they're talking to no one. So I believe that that is what drives you bananas, people who don't want to talk to you. How did we do? Well, I would have to say my answer is quite different from yours, but I can empathize with how you're feeling, Alan. Oh, uh, sorry, Jane, I didn't hear that part. The, my earbud was uh, malfunctioning. Uh, Something along the lines you said that I was right. In any case, Jane, I can't wait to hear from you more later. Thank you for your report. Thank you, Alan. Unaccompanied migrant children arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border will be housed at Pomona Fairplex in Los Angeles County. Eagle News correspondent Tristan Diaz joins us tonight with the details. Thank you, Alan. Pomona Fairplex in Los Angeles County will be an emergency intake site to temporarily shelter unaccompanied minors that have arrived at the southern border between the United States and Mexico. The Fairplex city of Pomona is located in the District 1 area of Los Angeles County. This site is 487 acres in size, home to the annually held Los Angeles County Fair as well as concerts 
trade shows, and flea markets. The Fairplex attracts more than 3 million people every year to its venue before the onset of the pandemic. This is an ideal location with ample facilities and buildings to offer the housing and amenities needed by the migrant children. Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors Chair Hilda Solis states, Los Angeles County has a responsibility and an opportunity to care for unaccompanied minors coming to the United States. This is not a border crisis, but instead it is everyone's crisis. According to Chair Solis, many migrants, many migrant youths make the dangerous journey to cross the border to come to the United States for a brighter future and to get away from the traumatic situation of poverty, violence, and other great struggles. Chair Solis is the board supervisor in the District 1 area as well as the daughter of immigrants. So she strongly agrees with the county addressing the, this issue and stepping up to provide the necessary assistance and support from food to education to the migrant children. Let's take a look at her press conference in Pomona Fairplex regarding this latest development. And let me be clear, this crisis we are here to address is one that affects all of us as well. It is not a border crisis, it is a humanitarian crisis, and that impacts all of us. That's why when the White House called me to see if Los Angeles County would be receptive to helping care for these young people, I did not hesitate. I knew this community would say unequivocally yes. Los Angeles counties from the Office of Immigrant Affairs to the Departments of Children and Family Services, Public Health, Health Services, and Mental Health will be on board to help in providing the family support required by the unaccompanied minors until they can transition to supportive homes or be united again with their families. In Bakersfield, California, Tristan Diaz, Eagle News, we live in interesting time. Back to you, Alan. Now, Tristan, is this the first site in L.A. County to house and provide support to unaccompanied migrant children that's, uh, that have arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border? Actually, Alan, this is the second site in the county, if I'm not mistaken. Just last week, the county established the first site with the approval of the Long Beach City officials at the Long Beach Conventional Cent Convention Center. Ma many of these children were being sheltered at Border Patrol facilities and overcrowding was becoming a great problem there. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or the HHS, reached out specifically to Long Beach City officials to temporarily shelter these unaccompanied children, including meals, medical health coverage, um, recreational and educational services, until they are connected again with family members or sponsors to care for them. With a max maximum capacity to house 1,000 children, the Long Beach Convention Center was selected with funding coming from the federal government, but will only be operational until August 2, due to contracts already in place during this time. Back to you, Alan. Tristan, it's uh, National Banana Day. And so again, in one word, what drives you bananas? I, I was actually preparing for this. Uh, it's a uh, drivers. Drivers. You know what? I'm also prepared for it because I was hoping somebody would mention drivers are driving. So here's what happens to me all the time. Drives me bananas. Uh, go drive through fast food, order the largest drink I possibly can just to find out that your cup holder is not big enough for you for your extra large drink. And so what drives me bananas is driving back to the office one handed drink in hand because your cup holders are too small. How did I do? And, and imagine your car is a stick shift, driving one hand, but um, not close enough. But uh, I, I can feel you on that too, Alan. Okay, well, thank you. We'll talk to you a little bit later. Museums in and around California's capital are set to reopen this month as pandemic restrictions ease and vaccination eligibility expands. Eagle News correspondent J.P. Era reports. As vaccines are starting to become accessible to people ages 16 years and older around California, the weight of the pandemic is slowly being lifted. 
More businesses around Old Sacramento and around the county are starting to reopen with modifications to ensure the safety of the community while also allowing people to enjoy and educate themselves about the history and culture of Sacramento. For the month of April, some museums located in and around Sacramento County are reopening to the public. Some of these museums include the Aerospace Museum of California, the California Automobile Museum, the Crocker Art Museum, the Roseville Utility Exploration Center, and even more. There are a variety of museums open for everyone, whether you have an interest in aviation or automobiles, or are looking to further your knowledge and appreciation in art or history. The entire list of open museums can be found at their website, sacmuseums.org. While these businesses are opened, they are all following the COVID-19 precautions to ensure everyone's safety. The museums are open up to 25% of their capacity, and all visitors need to wear a mask and maintain physical distancing while exploring their attractions. While they are open to the public now, depending on the condition of the county, they may shut down again if required by the public health guidelines. With the reopening of these businesses, it looks as if we are moving closer to the light at the end of the tunnel. With the full reopening of California anticipated in June, as announced by Governor Gavin Newsom, this is just one step towards that direction. As more people are being vaccinated, it is hopeful that we will finally be able to overcome this pandemic. During these times, please continue to take care of yourselves and each other. In Sacramento, J.P. Era, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. We'll see you at the museum, J.P., thank you. Up next, an update from New Jersey. Business news and tonight's roundtable about what makes us go bananas. Fashion is fashion. Not even coronavirus can stop people from wanting what to wear and when to wear them, even during lockdowns. With the rolling out of vaccinations all over the world, we see hope in the fashion industry. This week, we are privileged to have a conversation with one of the fashion industry's most recognizable international designer brands. I think the most important thing really is figuring out how to reboot your business. Whatever business you have, there's a real change in the expectations and the way a consumer is doing her business. And I think that every industry has to reboot and so I think it's just having that agility. The CEO and Chief Creative Officer of the House of Natori will give her outlook on the fashion business and share tips to MSMEs on creativity, marketing, and innovation from her living room in New York. Ms. Josie Natori will join us in this episode of Open for Business. Welcome back. This is Eagle News America. I'm Alan Basoyahe in Los Angeles. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy introduces a series of reforms aimed to reduce gun violence in the state. In Union Township, Bureau Chief Carlo Valdez reports. Thanks, Alan. To try and fight and end gun violence in the state of New Jersey, Governor Murphy spoke in Newark on Thursday unveiling reforms to reduce it. Here's Governor Murphy with some words. Let's take a look. It cannot be overstated that together and over just the past three plus years, we have reset New Jersey's reputation as a leader in the fight against senseless gun violence. We have enacted new laws and invested in community-based solutions that strike at the heart of this issue. After eight years of any meaningful action to curb gun violence, I am proud that over the past three plus years, New Jersey has returned to the head of the class and was one of only two states in the entire country to earn an A from the Giffords Law Center in their most recent rating. This is a point of pride for us. Through it all, however, we remain as committed to inclusive solutions and policy making in the fights against gun violence as ever. And just as we are committed to and are aggressive, aggressively working to having the most inclusive and deep reaching COVID vaccination program of any state, we are equally committed to and we will work just as aggressively to have the strongest protections against gun violence of any state in America. The plan includes a $10 million proposal for community-based violence intervention. 
and also the package includes proposals to require firearm safety training, mandate safe storage of firearms, raise the minimum age to purchase long guns to 21, and establish electronic ammunition sales record keeping. And as for coronavirus stats and numbers, New Jersey reports of 3,411 new positive PCR tests, pushing the total to 848,566. Sadly, New Jersey is reporting 47 new confirmed deaths, pushing the total to 22,461 lives lost. In Union Township, New Jersey, Carlo Valdez, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Alan. Several stories from our business desk. The country's retail industry has seen a notable growth in March. This story and more from Bobby Soriano. Take a look. Good evening. U.S. markets have closed. Here are your latest business headlines. New economic numbers were out today, showing the U.S. economy continuing its strong recovery in March. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, U.S. shoppers boosted retail spending by 9.8% last month, the largest monthly gain in almost a year, powered by additional spending money via stimulus funds and more businesses reopening from pandemic restrictions. The gain followed a revised 2.7% drop in sales during February and was spread over several categories, including sales at restaurants and purchases for clothing, electronics, sporting goods, and vehicles both online and in physical stores. Some analysts have expressed concern about the downturn the economy may have once stimulus funds have run out, but for the time being, consumer businesses continue to enjoy the extra spending. San Francisco-based e-wallet provider Plantina has secured another round of funding and looks to expand its merchant partnerships in the Philippines. According to news outlet TechCrunch, the fintech startup, which began serving the country in October of 2020, has found great success in the growing e-money trend, which allows users to quickly borrow small amounts of money that are automatically loaded onto their smartphones and can be used to purchase goods at convenience stores such as 7-Eleven. As the user pays off these loans on time, Plantina uses their payment history to build a credit profile, which can then be relied on to qualify for larger loans in the future. The round of funding announced today by Plantina includes 2.2 million from various investors, and the company looks to use this money to secure partnerships with other merchants that are regularly frequented by Filipinos. E-money accounts have found great success in developing countries where the population has easy access to smartphones, with research by the Central Bank of the Philippines showing that as early as 2018, e-money accounts have already surpassed physical credit cards as the preferred method of borrowing money. Lastly, for our bubble tea lovers out there, you may want to get your next order soon before it's too late. According to news outlet MarketWatch, due to a shipping backlog on the West Coast, the country is now experiencing a shortage of boba balls and tapioca starch, which is the main ingredient in making them. The shipping backlog has deliveries from countries such as Taiwan and Thailand where the ingredients originate from on a delivery delay that could last several months. This has forced bubble tea providers such as the Boba Guys to issue videos on social media to warn their customers about the impending shortage, which could start as early as next week, and to please have patience with them as they await for their next shipment. Boba shops have been a hot trend around the U.S. in recent years particularly in major metropolitan areas and the West Coast. And the shortage could not come at a worse time as the warmer months approach and consumers are looking for their next boba-infused cold drink fix. Finally, turning to unemployment numbers, first-time unemployment claims continue their drop below pandemic levels, with the Labor Department reporting a decrease in the national unemployment rate to 6%. U.S. indices once again hit new highs today, powered by strong consumer spending and positive economic news, with the Dow closing above 34,000 for the first time in history. Reporting from New York, Bobby Soriano, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. 
Thanks, Bobby, for the Bobo Report. And now we turn our focus to National Banana Day. But we're not going to be talking about recipes or food with bananas in them. We'll go beyond the digestive appeal it has. Let's go figurative tonight. What things or instances make you go bananas? We're going to bring back our Eagle News team whose uh, uh, situations that made them go bananas, I totally failed at guessing. But we're going to ask them right now to reveal uh, to us one and all. So, uh, Eagle News team, why don't we go ahead and ask, how about let's begin with uh, Anna. Anna, you gave us a clue that it was people. What drives you bananas? Yes, Alan. So we, we have the similar uh, uh, situation, right? You mentioned waiting in line at the, at, at the grocery store. So it has something to do with, with me, people, and customer service. Um, it drives me bananas when people do not render good customer service. Uh, no matter no matter where it is, because uh, to me, if your if your job is to serve people, um, no matter what, you should always do your best to provide customer great customer service. Alan, I think we've all experienced that. Uh, you know, especially as if if it seems as if the customer service representative is having a bad day, but the customer should always be treated as if someone who uh, might be. Uh, going through something uh, as well. And so they should also be treated uh, with a lot of dignity and respect. Couldn't agree with you uh, more, Anna. Let's uh, turn to, how about Jane? I'm, we're all ears, okay? You mentioned ears, we're all ears. What is it that drives you bananas? Well, Alan, uh, with regards to your response earlier about ears, um, you mentioned Bluetooth. Um, this is more like the opposite. Um, what I... It, what drives me bananas is loud noises, especially if it's in a setting like I'm uh, in a, I guess maybe a coffee shop where I'm studying or doing my reports and uh, there are loud noises behind me. Or if my my dog is a, a, a culprit, he likes to bark when he's excited or happy. So when he barks really loud, sometimes even during like one of our newscasts, uh, I've caught him uh, trying to bark really loud. Uh, loud noises kind of drive me bananas. And uh, most of the time you'll see me wearing uh, earphones or, or Bluetooth if I'm trying to uh, minimize the noise disturbance. Alan? Is that hot coffee or cold coffee, Jane? Oh, it depends on the weather. Well, probably since the Texas droughts are coming, it's most likely going to be cold coffee <laughs> coming up. Last thing we want is, is ice cold coffee all over ourselves because something behind us uh, startled us. So uh, Bluetooth, noise canceling Bluetooth uh, earbuds, I think is the way to go. So yes, definitely it drives me bananas as well. Thanks, Jane. We're going to move on. I'm just going to go in order here. Um, let's go to Kay. Kay, you mentioned education. What is it that drives you bananas? Well, um, I'm a freshman in college this year, actually, and I think everyone knows the situation that uh, students taking online classes are kind of going through from, you know, long Zoom meetings to homework that goes way past. That doesn't really apply to anything that you really need to do. Uh, busy work that's just that burns out your eyes more uh, from Zoom fatigue. I mean, there's just a lot of things that I think um, a lot of students are kind of going through right now. And I'm not going to lie, it kind of drives me bananas too. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going so bananas. I mean, you know, you might as well call me K from the potassium that is found in bananas. Oh, we love that. You certainly are a, a college student, you know, because you're, you're so witty. Uh, Bluetooth? Uh, earbuds and coffee, do, do any of those things help you to study or are you not a caffeine person? Um, I try not to overdo it on my caffeine because that kind of destroys me. <laughs> okay. Well, we certainly don't want you uh, to be destroyed, Kane. We understand. Yeah, uh, uh, education, college especially, can certainly drive anybody bananas, but you are holding yourself together quite well. Looking to someone who's also in college, I believe, right? Brianna, talk to us. What drives you bananas? You said something about siblings and we just found out that you're the eldest, not the youngest, like I am. But I, th I think we can still uh, uh, have a discussion here. What drives you bananas when it comes to siblings? What doesn't drive me bananas <laughs> for my siblings? I mean, I'm the oldest, so the younger ones, they kind of, uh, in a way, look up to me, right? But in the way that they look up to me, they also like to bother me when they look up to me, <laughs> you know? like if they want help with their homework, which I don't mind doing. I, I'm okay helping with homework, but at the times that it's like, 
oh, I need help with my trigonometry or my calculus. I'm just like, I just went through that already. I don't really want to touch it again. And it's just like, oh, okay, I'm the eldest. I got to help you, but I can't help you with a lot of things at the time too. And especially like Kay said, with uh, school, with everything being online, I'm still at home and I still have my sisters around me. So when I'm trying to do work or do studying and they're maybe on vacation different times as me, it's like, oh, I could be doing that too, right? I could just go and play too, but I have school and you don't. So it's kind of like, oh, they're trying to pull me and annoy me in little ways, you know? <laughs> Well, well, Brianna, that's our goal. Our goal as the younger siblings is to annoy the elders as, as much as we can. Have you tried sweets? You know, giving the youngest uh, member of your sibling family sweets seems to help a lot. Have you ever tried that? I have, and I'm, I like to bake a lot. I like to do cookies and all that stuff, and I bake for them quite a bit. But I think it's gotten to the point where I bake for them a little too much, and that they're still going to annoy me every now and then. Well, Brianna, remember, I'm the youngest in, in my family, too, so sweets can go, certainly go my way. And lastly, Brianna, you know, um, you said you help them as the, as the eldest sister. It's great that you have two sisters, and what they can ask you for relates. Myself, I'm, I'm the youngest of three, and my two elders are uh, girls as well. So when I came to them for advice, I really didn't get very much out of them. I asked them for help with fashion, and, you know, I, I was stuck at a dead end. Does it help? that at least your younger siblings are, are also girls? I think so, yes. If they were like younger brothers, I think that'd be a little more annoying. So yes, younger sisters help a lot. <laughs> well, someone that I consider as a younger brother, but certainly isn't annoying. How about you, Tristan? You talked about drivers. What drives you bananas? Um, well, I mean, uh, I believe everyone who drives can uh, agree with me on this, but you know, they, they're there, but a lot of people don't use them, which is the, uh, the blinkers. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to change lanes and then someone who's in front of you is also going to change lanes, but don't use the blinkers. That's uh, just a little bananas. Or if, uh, they, if they start, you know, pressing on their brake out of nowhere, I don't know what they're doing. And then all of a sudden they uh, turn right or turn left to a street and uh, they don't use their blinkers, it drives me bananas. <laughs> well, Tristan, I'm not going to be the person who drives you bananas because I'm the other person. The person who turns on their signal forgets that they had their turn signal on and never changes lane. So <laughs> at least in that uh, respect, I won't drive you bananas. You know what, team? What also drives me bananas is coming to the end of our broadcast to say goodbye to all of you after spending uh, this, uh, this broadcast with you. But before I let you go, as always, at the end of every broadcast, we don't forget to recognize the efforts of our healthcare workers, first responders, and essential workers by giving them a round of applause. Join me. Thank you for being our modern day heroes. We appreciate you. And that is today's Eagle News America. Thanks for joining us. I'm Alan Basoyahe. We live in interesting times. Start up your weekday mornings with edutainment, news, and information kasama ang inyong paboritong Net25 shows. Samahan ang inyong paboritong morning barkada sa Pambansang Almusal.